Hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry for the quality of the. Well, I'm sorry for a lot of things right now. I'm sorry about the quality of the audio on this, as I um, I'm here at school trying to get this video done and to you as quickly as possible, and I don't have my microphone with me. I forgot to put it in my backpack. Um, so I'm sorry. the The audio quality will improve uh, in and be more like all the other ones. Uh, I just don't have the mic today, and I'm sorry about this kind of last minute thing that I did last night with canceling the video lecture and making it up. Um, today, uh, I was, I don't, I've been, I've been kind of alluding a couple times to the sort of insane schedule I've got this quarter with Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, but it just, I was wrecked last night, and thankfully I woke up this morning and I'm not feeling uh, too sick or like I'm getting an illness or something like that, but I was just completely out of gas last night. Um, and I'm feeling better today, and I think you're going to get a better lecture out of me. <laughs> I'll hopefully make more sense than what would have happened if we had done it last night. Um, but I am sorry that uh, this might mean that less people are able to show up. By the way, on that front, so in terms of improving these overall uh, experience of the video lectures online, um, like I mentioned in uh, my last video, I've got everything with the internet sorted out, which is awesome so there shouldn't be any more problems if you're connecting for the live lectures with like bad video quality getting dropped from the calls things like that but on the other front um, remember I was trying to find a way um, with Google to be able to get more people to be able to show up live um, the last couple times we've not had as many people so we haven't run into that problem but I think that might be because just the quality of the experience was bad maybe that's my best guess um, that it was like one of those things where it's like, well, if I can't connect anyway and I'm getting dropped and the video's cutting out and everything, then I'll just watch it on YouTube later. And that would be completely understandable. Um, but I'm, I'm sad if that happened at all. Um, but hopefully that now that that's fixed, maybe some of you are going to be more um, interested um, if you're available to be able to show up for those live lectures. I definitely, we haven't had a lot of feedback too during the lectures. Maybe that's going to continue at once we get more into the business ethics unit, which we're about to do. This is going to be our last session with the ethical crash course sort of thing. Um, but I want to really encourage people to do that if they can. I think it makes your experience better. I think it makes the class better um, for everyone who's watching on YouTube later, too, when, when there's questions going on. Um, I just know what's been going on in my on-campus version of this class, which I'm teaching this quarter, and there's always lots of questions and things to clarify. and potential misunderstandings to, to target and address and things like that. So um, your participation really does make a difference uh, in the quality of everything. So I definitely want to invite that. And I'm going to try to make that as um, welcoming as possible and, and rewarding for you um, so it's not a waste of your time. But on that front about getting more people in, I uh, tracked down some things with the tech people here at Bellevue College. And then what it turns out is that um, the school uses, as kind of like an affiliation with Microsoft, to use all of their suite of internet apps and stuff like that. So they told me they don't provide support for this Google for Educators account thing that I was trying to set up because they don't use Google products. They're not affiliated with Google. So we might, um, I'm going to do some more research. It looks like they use, um, Microsoft's product is now Skype. Skype, uh, another kind of video conference calling kind of um, app that Microsoft now has control over, and that's what they use. So uh, apparently, I could have up to a thousand participants on a video lecture using Skype, so that would solve that problem. So you might see from me um, for next week um, switching over to Skype instead of Google Hangouts. Um, if anyone has a problem with that, uh, if that's an issue or a complication, let me know. I know it's kind of just inconvenient, but it might be worth the payoff if it means more people are able to attend. I mean, it sounds like if we have the Skype thing hooked up that everyone in the class conceivably could attend the video lecture. I know probably for scheduling and work and stuff that's not possible for you, but, um, or maybe not something that you want to choose to do, but it would be possible, and I think that'd be worth doing. So I'm going to try to get that set up, um, and it'll probably just mean switching which applications we're using. So. Um, I didn't know that about the school's setup. I just thought Google was like free and, and, and kind of open access. So um, of course they would use it, but it looks like they don't. So I got a, I got a kind of a memo from 
uh, one of the IT people being like, no, we don't support that, but we do support this, and this will do what you need, so use that. So I think we will. More on that next week, uh, getting ready for next week. I'll give you some uh, info on that. But in terms of our lecture today, and finishing up our unit on, on this kind of uh, crash course in ethical theory, uh, we've got some more stuff about Aristotle I want to talk about. Um, we, we've got kind of his core um, vision or theoretical, theoretical definition for what an ideal human life and an ideal human looks like. Um, but there's going to be a lot more of uh, the application of this that is really Aristotle's main concern, as he says uh, in the Nicomachean Ethics and in many places. Um, we care about the good, not so that we can know it, but so that we can do it, so that we can actually live it, that we can manifest it. So Aristotle is really motivated to think about these questions of like, what do we have to be like in order to achieve this ideal? Um, and so that's where his, a lot of his uh, ethical writings start venturing into what looks like or is sort of similar to uh, self-help books and all that kind of stuff. I mean, really, the, the modern self-help book is the latest descendant of the legacy and the tradition of virtue ethics. And sometimes it's done sloppily, sometimes it's not done um, with maybe as much wisdom or care or something like that. But it, that, that general program of like thinking about ourselves, what are we like psychologically especially, that's part of the picture we're gonna get into today in terms of figuring out what do we have to work with here? What are the mechanisms whereby someone actually does become better um, and thus live a better life? So we're going to finish that up, and then I want to talk about some, um, go back to kind of a, a big picture summary of, of all these different theories. I, I had that um, discussion board up uh, called Dumb Questions uh, to try to see if there are things you're wondering about to try to be, have this be a little more responsive, and I can figure out what I need to talk about more, or maybe what I can help explain uh, or give. Um, some kind of context for or help you connect the dots with all this sort of stuff before we start diving into the core of the class uh, which is going to address ethical issues in the business world. Um, so this is kind of like our last getting ready to take the plunge into that. Um, so I'll try to answer those questions to the best of my ability. Um, the ones that were posted, there still weren't a ton. I wish there were more. Um, uh, in, in case you're, I'm speaking now to people who haven't been as plugged in with the class up to this point, um, part of that is, um, I guess, natural because I haven't been forcing as many things to, have to happen in the mechanics of the course. Like, this whole first unit's had a lot of optional readings um, and optional um, ways of participating, um, but it's going to change a lot from here on out. There's going to there's going to be a, a more of that, like what I was alluding to in my very early video lectures, like framing the class and what's going to happen this quarter. We're going to be getting down to brass tacks, and there's going to be a lot more mechanics to things, um, and a lot of um, increased ways of that you're going to be required to participate um, in this class uh, online um, and with discussion boards and things like that. So I was hoping for more, but um, you know, maybe that's that is my fault for not making it an official assignment that has credit and all that kind of stuff. But there's going to be a lot of that coming up. That's that's what will be the the tone of the class and the workflow is going to definitely change and ramp up. So there's going to be a lot of readings that are mandatory, and you'll have those reading comment um, assignments that are going to look like discussion board posts um, where you ask questions and and sort of share your opinions and your reactions and comments on what we're uh, studying, the ideas that are in these readings. Um, so things are going to change and I want to alert you to that and um, so yeah, and that will start next week with our uh, first session next week, which I'm going to do the Monday thing again. Any, any, when, any chance in which I'm able to not stack up my Tuesday, Thursday, I think is going to be good, not just for me, but for you too. When I'm coming into the the evening video lecture, just like, phew, like I, you've seen probably my other videos from like Thursday nights and stuff. Like I can pull up the energy and get it out there, but um, you know the mental strain. I, I probably can give a better product if it's if it's in a more comfortable space. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into finishing up Aristotle. So I'm going to pull up here my my Aristotle lecture notes. 
And this was the stuff we were talking about last time, that um, Aristotle's got this kind of uh, formula for what makes for uh, an example of human life at its very best, this idea of eudaimonia. Um, and he has these four components. Activity of soul. Um, so you're doing things, you're active. It's not just passive abilities, but you're demonstrating those abilities intentionally, done by a reason, done with understanding, um, purposefully, uh, in awareness of why this would be the good thing to do. Um, equipped with the necessary relevant resources that are needed, the, the participation from the world, in order to create the excellent life. And like we talked about uh, in the last session, this excellent life is going to be this kind of patchwork quilt of a bunch of particular excellences. And those excellences we first get on our radar by just recognizing that they are things that, they're functions that humans, the human thing is capable of performing. Um, but there's so many human functions out there, uh, things that humans are capable of, that to be excellent at every single one of them seems impractical and impossible. And to help with that, Aristotle uh, gives us a criteria that we talked about last time of these things that um, help us figure out which of those excellences to prioritize in trying to flesh out what that excellent life act actually looks like. So, I don't know if you remember my silly example from last time about um, is it a function of, of a person, me potentially, to be able to burp the Star Spangled Banner um, with perfect melody? Yeah, like that's something I could, I could work at doing excellently. Do I need to do that in order to be living the excellent life? No, probably not. It's not going to score very well on these criteria, whereas other values will. Like I've mentioned, Aristotle's big thing, is, one of his big things is about friendship. Um, being able to be an excellent friend is part of living the excellent life and appreciating the goods that come from, from having that virtue, from being able to be a good friend. Um, that is a, that's part of the vision of what the excellent life looks like. And that's because it's going to score pretty well on these things. So I was drawing a picture last time of kind of some of these things more at the center, some of them more periphery, the things at the center that really are the, the major elements when you're putting together this picture, like a diorama of the excellent life. They deserve more attention. They deserve more effort. Um, they're more important to realize in order to make progress on um, modeling your life more closely onto this ideal picture. Okay. So where are we going to go next? Well, when Aristotle's talking about these kinds of excellences that humans are capable of, he organizes them into two categories um, that correspond with a kind of basic distinction that he sees in the human person. So like what we do and how we function. He splits into these two spheres. One of them is rational. It's into the intellectual virtues. Um, so it's all about the operations of reason. Um, this is where knowledge lives uh, and wisdom, your ability to understand things. And Aristotle says excellence here is a matter of uh, experience because you need experience of the world to be in a position to know about it and to be able to reason with those experiences in the best way. So learning logic. Um, standards of critical reasoning, um, your ability to evaluate ideas for their merits or to evaluate evidence for what it shows, what it proves to you about how things are. All of that, that kind of, uh, the, the raw material of experience plus the skills of reasoning well, that is what gets you intellectual excellence. And that's how it's achieved. Okay? And that's the key question we're looking at now. Like, how do we actually do these things? And Aristotle would say, if you want to have intellectual excellence, you've got to have a lot of experiences um, or have access to experiences, like when other people have experiences and report on them, like someone else. Like, a, I don't, if I'm going to be a good scientist, Aristotle doesn't think I need to run every single experiment ever. I just need to know about the experiments other people have run and the experiences they've had through their observations that are a part of that experiment and reason with that information. I had, I'm, I'm clarifying this just because I think I was talking with some other student about this. Maybe it was in my other class. But um, it was in the context of Kant and like knowledge by experience, this kind of thing. Experience doesn't just mean your experiences. It means possible experiences. So other people have had. And even if I, 
learn from someone else's experiences, I still need the experience of talking to them and finding and judging that they are trustworthy and stuff like that, um, that they're accurately reporting their experiences to be able to learn from them and gain insight in that way. And Aristotle has that in mind too. It's not all personal firsthand, it can be secondhand, um, but that's what he has in mind. So that experience coupled with training. Aristotle was one of the first people in the Western world to really put together a rigorous science of logic, um, like contemporary um, logical systems, symbolic logical systems, uh, are really based on, uh, in many ways, Aristotle. Like that's it can be traced back to Aristotle. Aristotle is also responsible for uh, really trying to pin down what are the standards for critical thinking and what are different, say, argumentative fallacies. He, he does the name putting of them and really codified a lot of this stuff. Now he's not the final word on it, but he definitely got the ball rolling on it. So that's a way in which he's putting his money where his mouth is. He's like, this is something that needs to be clarified so it can be trained. Um, but Aristotle says none of us have innate intellectual excellence. Um, this is all stuff that has to be learned from experience. Um, and in the same way, the, the, so that's on the one side, on the other side, there's what he calls character excellence. And what are we talking about when we're talking about character? Well, it's kind of this other side of us. There's the rational side to us, but then there's this other part of us and our psychology, which isn't really, um, it's not about reason directly. It's about everything else. So this is actually uh, very, very similar to what Kant's talking about when he's talking about the worlds of self-generated laws versus laws of inclination. Um, those are... They're, I think Kant's pretty inspired by Aristotle here. I think he's influenced by Aristotle in that regard. Um, you, there's this rational side of us, and then this non-rational or a-rational side. Um, the logic of feelings and emotions and desires and all sorts of psychological tendencies don't always play by the laws of logic, or they don't. They don't. Uh, they're not held accountable to rational standards. They're not necessarily conceptual. They have influence on us without participating with conscious conceptual recognition or thought. Um, it's all the rest of it. It's all the rest of our psychology that's very causal, biological, um, all that kind of stuff. And when it comes to this non-rational side of our beings, Aristotle has a very different vision for what excellence there looks like. Now, now for Kant, because Kant was talking about morality, right, and moral responsibility. He was like, I can't see moral responsibility on that side of our psychological causal natures. Why? Well, because in that respect, we're kind of like a boulder, right? And boulders don't, like, remember my boulder example? Boulders aren't evil or morally pure or something. They don't, they don't make wrong choices and right choices. They don't have any choices. They're just subjects to the causal forces. But do you remember in the boulder example, I mentioned, yeah, we can't talk about right or wrong here. Um, that doesn't seem to fit the logical category for, the, for morality in that sense. But we can still talk about good and bad. I can still say it's tragic that the boulder crushed my friend on that hiking trip. Um, I could look at, uh, here's another example. Let's say an uh, airplane lifts off with a bunch of passengers and there's something wrong with the wiring and the faulty wiring causes the plane to explode and everyone dies. Um, we wouldn't say the plane did something evil or immoral because uh, it was just this wiring issue. We could talk about the people who are checking up on the plane for sure and whether they did something negligent, right? Um, but we can call the episode tragic because people died, and that's a bad result. But we can also talk about faulty, bad wiring. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not uh, performing its function excellently, like Aristotle's been talking about with people. So we can think from, from Aristotle, who's not doing the moral thing, who's just talking about some ethical ideal, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to make a distinction between moral and ethical here, but there's a distinction between the world of moral responsibility and right and wrong, and just the things that we're talking about as good and bad. Aristotle's still trying to figure out about good and bad, even if he's not commenting on right or wrong. So he's trying to figure out what's a good person. So the fact that something isn't rational or intentional, that there's that side of us, we can still talk about whether that's well-functioning or malfunctioning. And that's where we're going to go next, is all of Aristotle's sort of commentary on that. By the way, he also thinks that character virtue, um, which I'll just refer to as virtue, period, virtue simpliciter from here on out. So every time I use the word virtue, I mean 
character virtue because that's what Aristotle focuses the most on. Uh, he also doesn't think that that's innate. You can't have innate virtues. Uh, part of it is because of his formula. Oh, hey, someone was able to show up. Yay, thanks for coming, Jennifer. Feel free to um, jump in as you uh, want to and ask questions and things like that. Um, I'm so happy someone was able to make it. Um, I'll fix the camera here. There we go. Wonderful. Um, oh, where was I? Um, oh, I hit, so part of it, the reason why Aristotle thinks that no character virtue is innate, just like no intellectual virtue is innate, is because um, he he thinks even if you were born with innate characteristics, and those innate characteristics were helpful toward you know doing the functions of human life in an excellent sort of way, um, there's still that component about doing things with understanding. Do you remember that? that activity of soul done via reason with understanding. So if I'm like psychologically compelled by some innate nature to do things in the right way, I'm in a really good position to be an excellent person, to have the excellence. All that I'm missing is just an awareness of what I'm doing. And that the intellectual virtue is going to be needed to be able to have that character virtue in a full, full sort of way. Um, but we can also kind of separate out just sort of what's the contribution that the character is making on its own here. Okay. Um, but, but ultimately, Aristotle is not happy calling something a virtue until it's accompanied, like a character virtue, until it's accompanied by the intellectual understanding as well. Okay, so while Aristotle is going to focus a lot of attention here on out in his theory on character, reason is still going to be in the picture, um, but he's not going to be giving it as big of a role as we've seen from Mill and Kant, and especially Kant, right? Because Kant puts a lot of eggs in that basket. Um, just uh, before I go further, Jennifer, are you hearing me? Is audio coming through and everything's going good? I just want to double check that. Yes, cool, awesome, wonderful. Thanks again for being here. Um, okay, so we're about to launch into the main meat for um, for what I wanted to finish up with Aristotle today, and that's going to be his sort of moral psychology, you might say, his picture of how human beings work and how we can get to a place, a state in ourselves, so that we are well-functioning instead of malfunctioning. Okay, so I'm going to actually do some screen sharing here for you, Jennifer, so you can follow along um, with uh, my lecture notes here. I'm, I've got a diagram in my lecture notes I'll be using um, to help explain what's happening. So let's pull that up. There we go. Okay. So we're going to skip, 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 skip. There's a lot of cool stuff with Aristotle here I'd love to talk about, but because this is a crash course and we've got some other things to do today, um, this is, I think, mostly what I'm going to discuss, and then, we'll, and then we'll leave Aristotle behind. If any of you, um, Jennifer, you, I'm talking to you uh, in the chat right now, or anyone who's watching this on YouTube later, uh, if you were able to check out the Nicomachean Ethics and read some of that stuff, um, you might have some other questions about what Aristotle thinks about things, and I haven't addressed them in my lectures. There, there is a lot of cool stuff going on in there. Um, I recommended books one, two, uh, and if you really wanted to, I'd go for ten. Uh, there's a lot of other cool stuff going on in the interim areas too, but those are really the big ones. Book one, books one, two, and ten. Um, but even just focused on that, uh, we, we have not been able to cover everything. But maybe getting a, the general gist of things and the overall framework. Um, it, and that's what will be definitely relevant for for the stuff that we'll be doing in the business world. But here, this little picture here um, is uh, Aristotle's sort of breakdown of a person and how we act, how our will gets determined in action. This is similar to what Kant was doing, um, but he paints a different picture than Kant does. So on the one hand here, we've got this bubble that says reason. And then on the other side, we have character. So these are the two sides of us that Aristotle sees as components to a complete human. A human has this rational faculty, but then they also have all this character stuff um, that's a part of our, our natures. Um, and what our character is composed of are dispositions. And we're going to use dispositions in somewhat of a technical sense here. Um, Dispositions are constituted by pain and pleasures. That's what I have written here in the diagram. 
but let's actually jump up a little bit here. So what um, a disposition is composed of particular pains and pleasures such that given a situation C, like a set of circumstances, that's why I called it C, a subject S, a certain person who has this disposition, who has this disposition, feels pain and pleasure P. So dispositions are different from person to person because the pattern about how these possible pains and pleasure feelings are linked up with possible circumstances will have a different pattern. So the disposition is just a theoretical object, like a psychological theoretical object that relates circumstances with responses. Now, I might feel like I'm like beating a dead horse here, like that th this is kind of a basic idea, but I do want to talk about this a little bit at length because I think there might be some room for possible confusion with it. I just want to make sure it's super clear. Uh, I'm motivated because my uh, on-campus class uh, yesterday when we talked about this on in class, a lot of people had questions about it and we had to kind of take some more time just to make sure we got it right. But um, dispositions are, you can kind of think about it like programming, like we use that metaphor with Kant where um, uh, Kant was talking about how self-generated laws to reason are how we're able to write our own programming but when it comes to our inclinations, the world of our psychology, we're subject to these rules that come from laws of nature. Well, think about the laws of nature kind of showing up in our lives in the particular ways that they do, governed by these psychological objects of dispositions. So they're, so they're different. Like, your tendencies for feeling things under certain circumstances is different from my tendencies to feel things under certain circumstances. And the thing that explains the difference is our sort of psychological makeup, our psychological character. And that's a matter of these, of these dispositions. So let, let's give an example. Um, if we were to say that I've got anger management issues, like I, I don't have anger management issues, but if I did, a, or a person that does have anger management issues, we'd talk about that as a part of their character. It's a part of their personality. It's part of their psychology, their psychological makeup. It's part of the, the landscape of their psyche or something like that. But what it would mean to have anger management issues, um, let's leave the way, like techniques for responding to it off to one side. I mean, one component of this will be what are the circumstances under which I am provoked in anger? So a lot of people who have anger management issues, um, it's not that they feel anger, it's that they're feeling anger way too often and because of triggering circumstances that really don't deserve that response. So you can feel anger, like there, there's situations that'll make you angry probably, unless you're a Buddhist enlightened or something, complete emotional detachment, uh, but if you're not that far along, uh, you probably will feel anger, or there are possible circumstances in which you would feel anger. That doesn't mean you're an angry person or something like that as a character trait. Um, we would probably reserve that label for the, the kind of person I'm describing, uh, someone who the slightest things will tick them off. Um, you know, someone just look, looks over at them in the grocery store and they're like, what's your problem kind of thing. That's a matter of a certain feeling that they have, a certain type of pain or pleasure. And, and Aristotle's not reducing these. That's important to note. This isn't like utilitarianism because Aristotle's actually very key, keen on emphasizing how every emotion, yeah, we describe them as in these groups of pains and pleasures, but they all have their own unique flavor. So there's a particular type of pain and pleasure that anger has in it and all of our emotional reactions have. Um, what makes it useful to talk about pain versus pleasure is the sort of, um, we might say, motivational momentum that the, these feelings have. Uh, more on that in a couple minutes. I'll, I'll come back to that thought. But these dispositions are just kind of like the hypothetical rules in your psyche for input-output, stimulus-response. So which circumstances will make me angry? Which circumstances will make me feel euphoria? What circumstances will make me feel sympathy? Um, which ones will make me sad? Like those are all the, the kind of shape of all that. The range of cases in which I'll have the feeling versus the range of cases in which I don't have the feeling, that's determined by my disposition. Or we can capture those realities in terms of talk 
of these dispositions. Okay, now these are very complex in us. We have complex psychologies, according to Aristotle. And we don't necessarily know the logical shape or the causal shape of these dispositions. Um, because the things that we experience are just the actual ones, right? I, I don't always know, well, if this had happened instead, how would I have felt about that? Um, but we speculate about this stuff all the time, and, and we get a sense of people, including ourselves. We get a sense of what our tendencies are. How am I prone to emotionally responding to being confronted with this kind of setting, scenario, uh, or stimulus? So that's what's going on with dispositions. Um, Jennifer, since you're the only one I got in the chat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you as my canary in the coal mine. How is my explanation of dispositions going so far? Is that feeling good? Yesterday in class, I was able to kind of look at my students' faces and tell that it wasn't clicking, and so we had to talk about it more. But that, that's feeling good? Cool. Awesome. Okay. Hopefully that's working for you out there in YouTube watching this later. Um, but so these dispositions are what make up our character. They're what, are, what define our personality. Uh, so they're, they're pains and pleasures that are triggered under certain circumstances and certain patterns. That's the state of our character. That's dispositions. Now... Here's where Aristotle starts making some bigger claims. Depending on what dispositions you have, you'll have these different reactions. Those reactions, those pains and pleasures that you feel, are what gonna are they're gonna determine how you actually go, are going to act. So this arrow that goes from dispositions to action, ignore the parentheses for right now, dispositions determine action. They determine how I will act. And you'll see this arrow pointing from reason to action with an X on it. That means that's representing how Aristotle thinks reason does not determine how we act. So this is big disagreement between Aristotle and Kant. Uh, Kant thinks that reason alone can get you to act. That we can also act from our dispositions, our inclinations for Kant. Um, but we can also act through pure reason. Aristotle doesn't think so. He doesn't see reason as having any motivational power whatsoever. It does not determine the will. Reason is more this thing that sees things. You see these two arrows about seeing. I'll talk about that in a second. But it's dispositions that are the things that prompt us to the behavior that we actually end up taking. Why? Well, this is where, going back to the idea of compartmentalizing these in the two categories of pain and pleasure, all it means to Aristotle that a feeling is a pain is that it has this momentum of kind of um, backing off. And I'm actually going to stop the screen sharing so you can see my gestures. Like, if I'm finding something painful, that means my feeling prompts me to, like, avoid it, to, like, steer clear of that. Um, the most basic version would be, like, some kind of physical pain, like I put my hand on a hot stove and I'm like, oh, ow! Right? Oh, you can't hear me? The audio cut out? Okay, cool, cool. Oh, it was probably when it stopped screen sharing, it just kind of like spazzed for a second. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Um, I'll be careful every time I make those transitions. So um, so I was saying a, a couple minutes ago that Aristotle thinks all the pains and pleasures are like utterly distinct and unique to them. In fact, he thinks every single action that we perform has its own unique flavor of pleasures and pains with it. And he thinks it's inappropriate to generalize pleasure as like, one thing. So he's opposed to utility too. He doesn't think you can do this reduction to a common theoretical element of utility. Um, he thinks all the pleasures and pains are distinct, but he organizes them in those two categories because he thinks um, pain is just the kinds of feelings that make me revolt from something, to back away from it, to hesitate. Like maybe, um, well, like we talked about at the beginning of the quarter about uh, debate and discussion. And I'm saying I think there's a lot of reason. I understand why people can find uh, the prospect of entering into an intellectual, philosophical, or ethical debate um, something painful. They're like anticipating, I don't like that feeling. I feel uncomfortable about this, and that's why I'm not going to take that action. I won't go into that space. All it means for Aristotle for something to be a pain is that it's an emotional feeling that motivates avoiding something. And all it means for something to be a pleasure is that we're drawn to it. That feeling draws us to that thing. So if I'm excited to debate, 
you know, then that's a pleasure in as much as I'm drawn into that space. I want to engage with that action. I want to engage with that set of circumstances. So that's all we mean here by, by pain and pleasure. So Aristotle thinks it's that drawing or backing off that is why it makes sense to say that feelings, sentiments, to use Mill's word for it, are the only things that cause us to act. So in kind of doing a side-by-side -side comparison here, when it comes to why do we do what we do, Aristotle and Mill are on the same side. I mean, Mill said the same thing. I, I didn't focus on this quite as much in my lectures, but if, if you read Mill and take a look at his theory, he thinks the only reason why we ever do anything that we do is because of our feelings, because of our sentiments. And that's why they're the only guide we have for trying to figure out what we ought to do. Um, they're the only indicator of value as well. But when it comes to just the psychological mechanisms of why do we do one behavior versus another, both Mill and Aristotle are going to say feelings. And those feelings are determined by our character. And reason doesn't do anything on its own. You can't get directions through reason. Now reason, for both Mill and Aristotle, reason can be like coupling with feelings and acquiring motivational weight. Like this sounds like Mill, right? He thinks um, the only reason why moral concepts, rational moral concepts, we find compelling is because of the feelings that come along with them, that give them this grounding, that give them this authority. And that's in contrast with Kant. Kant thinks uh, uh, reason can act, like we can act on our sentiments, they do determine our will, but we can also act out of pure respect for reason. And what Kant means is like, just me rationally recognizing this is my moral duty, this is what's good, the judgment of goodness, the rational judgment of goodness gets us to act if we respect it. Um, if we don't respect them, then we won't, of course. Uh, I can entertain a principle theoretically and be like, yeah, but I don't buy it, so I won't act on it. But if I respect it, if I'm like, yeah, this thing really is good, that can cause me, Kant thinks, to act even if all my feelings are telling me, whoa, whoa, don't do that. Ah, pain, 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 pain. I'm like, but it's the right thing to do, so I'm going to do it despite my feelings. So there's a big disagreement there. I'm not going to try to resolve that disagreement right now, but I just want to kind of indicate it. It's definitely something that helps to motivate and understand where other people come from when they debate on ethical matters, like ethical matters in business, too. Uh, okay, so that's about um, moral motivation, what causes us to act. And Aristotle thinks not reason, always feelings. Okay, now here's where Mill and Aristotle start to drift, though. Remember for Mill, he thinks not only are feelings the only reason why we act, but they're also the only guide or evidence to what is good. That was Mill's sentimentalism, this meta-ethical theory of normative justification. That He's putting those eggs in the basket of feelings, too. Aristotle doesn't want to do that. And this is despite the fact that he's kind of cool with making intuitive appeals all the time when he's making arguments in his work. But he thinks, ultimately, um, pain and pleasure can't guide you to what's good and bad. Why? Because the fact that you find something pleasurable or painful could be the problem. right? You could be, if the mechanism by which my behavior is determined are my feelings, well, if we think about the possibility of malfunctioning behavior, behavior that doesn't achieve the function or the excellent end, what's going to be responsible for that? Your feelings. So that could be the problem. Aristotle would say, uh, if you're like, I don't see why I should have empathy for other people's suffering. I don't, I don't feel anything. I, I look at the suffering, I don't feel anything. Aristotle would be like, that's your problem. right? That the excellent person would feel this under this set of circumstances. And if you don't find that compelling, well, that just means you're not good. And that's why he can be kind of, he can sound a little dismissive sometimes. Uh, of this question of like, why should I care about being a good person? Aristotle will be like, if you don't care about being a good person, that's strike one. <laughs> right? You're just like, he's like, you just have bad character. Now, Kant and Mill want to kind of talk about moral obligation and moral responsibility. So they want to sort of emphasize or argue for like, why should you care about this? What is the reason why you should see yourself as under this obligation? But since Aristotle's not attempting that philosophical project, he's not, he doesn't have those theoretical ambitions, 
maybe a little more open for him to do this sort of move. But there's a definitely concern about whether that's question begging. But that's exactly Aristotle's point here. A pleasure or pain cannot confirm about itself that it is legitimate. You got to have something else outside of it. And that we already have the theoretical structure from Aristotle to explain. Aristotle thinks good defined by function. So whether I ought to feel this way depends on whether that fulfills the function of the excellent life or not. Let's go back to our map. How are, how are you doing, Jennifer? Any questions with what I've been talking about so far? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, you can you can hear me again. Is the audio cut out again? Oh, I. Uh, you think I? You have a problem with Aristotle judging you? Ah, uh, but you, are you saying you don't care about being a good person? <laughs> ah, okay. Um, it, well, yeah, uh, Aristotle would ha take issue with that. Who is he to judge you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this is where it can't just be a matter of his judgment, and that's why he needs a theory. Um, so he's got to back that up with something. Um, Aristotle's not saying... Hey, it's, uh, this is actually something that came up in the uh, dumb questions thing that I'm, I'm planning on talking about. I actually want to devote a good amount of time to. Um, but Aristotle's not saying something like, oh, that was your question. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, well, um, hmm, do I want to do this now or later? I think I want to do this later, Jennifer. I'll, I'll, I'll address, I think, what I'm imagining is the like major kind of concern about this, about authority and whose right it is to judge people and that sort of thing. For right now, I'll just say this. Aristotle is not thinking that it's somehow his say-so that makes it so or something like that. He's presenting a theory uh, that you can agree or disagree with, that you, we can look at and see whether this is rationally compelling or not. Like, do these arguments succeed or do they fail? Um, Aristotle's opinion is not just his opinion man or something like that, but it's backed up with a theoretical argument. The, and that argument starts with his observation that, you, we look, we just can't talk about good. Goodness is not a thing all by itself until we think about what something is good for. So if you think um, it doesn't matter to uh, try to be a good person, uh, that that's irrelevant, you're thinking of human life as being composed of different goods than what Aristotle is saying or arguing that it's composed of. Um, maybe you're thinking, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, feel free to clarify what you think is good. Um, but Aristotle would say, let's look at the things that you think are good, and can those stack up against the arguments he's made for why the excellent life would be fleshed out in this way, in which being a better person would, be, uh, would look like this. Um, if someone wanted to say, uh, there's nothing good in life, it doesn't make any sense to participate with value whatsoever, I mean, that's a theoretical question that I engage with quite a bit, um, that's kind of fatalism or despair. I'm very interested in the topic of despair. I'm actually going to give a talk uh, later next month, at the end of next month, to the whole BC campus about uh, despair and some of the reasons for despair. But Aristotle's not really engaged with that question. Um, that doesn't mean it's not important uh, or that maybe he needs to have a story about that, but that's kind of a separate matter. I mean, Aristotle at the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics is clear to sort of identify his audience. He's like, he's bas his attitude is basically this. I'm going to start this discussion talking about what it is to be a good person. Why does that matter? So that we can do it. If you don't care about doing that, then I guess this isn't helpful to you. He's like, but if you do think there are better and worse ways to live, if you think just that that's even a theoretical possibility, then I've got some help for you. I've got some reflections, some observations, some arguments, some reasoning for how you can track down figuring out how to be what it is in substance to be a good person and how to actually realize that. Um, so, yeah, I think Aristotle would 
I mean, just by his position, think um, if you don't subscribe to this ideal standard, this vision, then that's part of the problem. That is part of the problem. And if you want to say, no, it's not a problem, then he, he would be like, okay, what's your argument for that? I, he kind of takes a take it or leave it, but just for the context, yeah, that, uh, so for those of you watching on YouTube, Jennifer asked, uh, so basically he's take it or leave it. Um, not really, not, not ultimately. Um, he's, when he's doing the Nico McKinnon ethics, he contextualizes his audience, like I was saying, um, but he would say anyone who doesn't care about being a good person or trying to live the best possible life, I mean, that's a loss of goodness. That's not better. Because <laughs> what we're talking about here is what is good and what is bad. Um, the take it or leave it attitude would philosophically mean something like, if you do it or you don't do it, it's good either way, or neither one of them is better than the other. And Aristotle's definitely committed to saying there are some forms of life here that are better than others. And he thinks that's pretty intuitive to us as well. Um, you just might have a different vision of what is good in life. That's why I was me mentioning earlier, you probably do have some sense of what you're choosing to pursue in life, what are the goods you're trying to attain. You have a picture of happiness. You have some vision of what you want your life to be like. Um, I'd be very surprised if you were taking classes in an accounting program without having some direction about that, uh, some sort of vision of what you think right now would be good for your life. And Aristotle will say, like, okay, that's okay. now you're part of the discussion. Let's have a debate about which vision of the good life is the best one, which one would truly be ideal. Uh, and then we'll get into a debate about that. But more about this authority of who is who to judge kind of thing, um, or where does moral authority come from, or something like that. Um, I guess I started talking about it already. I was going to talk about it quickly and move on, but I, I kind of jumped into it. But there is more to say, and so I'm going to save that for a little bit later on here. Uh, and I want to finish up this stuff about Aristotle and his um, picture of human psychology and how we work. So up to this point, we said, for Aristotle, reason does not act directly, doesn't have that power. Dispositions have that power. Feelings of pain and pleasure draw us toward or away from certain behaviors, and that determines how we act. But um, dispositions, feelings of pain and pleasure, cannot verify themselves. And that's where his good defined by function thing comes from. That's what's showing up over here on the far left end of the diagram with the end. The end is determined by the function. Those are basically the same things. Um, they set the success condition. And in the big picture, for what's a good human, the end is the excellent life. So going back to our definition up here, um, the end that all of our activity that's done intentionally, that needs to be empowered with relevant resources, that's all toward the end of achieving the excellent life. And the excellent life is this complex patchwork quilt of a bunch of particular excellences, and the ones that are most important are the ones that are complete, self-sufficient, uniquely human, and stable, according to Aristotle. Um, so that's all what's going on inside this little bubble on the far left end of the diagram. The arrows that are pointing from the left to the right are how we're determining goodness. So once I know what the function is, now I can figure out what's the good action. The same way that if, I'm, if I know the function of, a, of a, a table is to hold things up, now I know what needs to be going on with the table in order to be a good table. So if I know the excellent life is to be able to have these other excellences, then I can look and see which actions are going to actually accomplish that and which ones won't. And this connection of how actions lead to certain results is basically the kind of rational wisdom, the kind of uh, knowledge that we get from physics. And basically all of our causal understanding of how the world works. So uh, let's say we're talking in the business world you know, like understanding how the market functions. And if you do this, what will be the result? All that kind of being a good businesswoman or businessman, um, that craft of it, that would be these kinds of connections. Under Understanding means ends rationality. Like if I, I can see through reason that the square peg will not fit in the round hole, they're just not gonna fit. This action will not lead to this result. If I'm like, I'm gonna make a million bucks 
by um, the I don't know drawing pictures of squirrels outside my house like is this that's not gonna that's not gonna be a result of that action I can see that if I have understanding and knowledge of the causal shape of reality uh, through experience and careful reflection on it so all of like empirical science is in this kind of category here it's it's knowledge of causality uh, in the physical world and once I know what the right action is by seeing what needs to happen in order for the end to be accomplished now I can start thinking about okay how do I need to feel what needs to be going on in my character psychologically so that I will be caused to do the action that is right and that's this last arrow that I have uh, highlighted here is determines virtuous vicious dispositions if I'm trying to figure out which of these states of character which of these dispositions are ideal virtues and unideal vices I figure that out by figuring out what I need to feel like in order to do the actions that will accomplish the excellent end okay so we're kind of reverse engineering the ultimate standard for how I should feel about things comes from the end the excellent life itself the goal and what needs to happen to accomplish that goal and how I need to feel in order to act that way the connections here that reason sees in this second leg of re coming off of reason to the right is basically the world of psychology and even if you're not a psychologist uh, like in I I done a bunch of work in cognitive science and psychologists in cognitive science refer to this thing called folk psychology that people even if they're not uh, trained or reading empirical studies or something like that they're not scientists about it they're not psychologists all of us are thinking about psychology where we recognize that there are connections between how we feel and how we act and we try to play with that to try to get us ourselves to kind of be in the good position to act in the way that we maybe see through reason is the thing that we ought to be doing that would be the proper goal um, and we know this about other people too we know like hey if I say this thing to this person um, they might have this emotional reaction if they have that emotional reaction to it then this kind of action may be possible or not possible they'll be prompted to do this like if I piss someone off they might get in a fight with me this kind of thing um, or recognizing that um, when people um, sort of feel like you respect them that they're more willing to have conversations with you like if they feel respected if they have those pains and pleasures happening then they'll engage in this behavior of like continuing a conversation with you or something like that so rationality also is what allows us to reflect on our own experience and observe the experiences of others or what's going on with them to see how there are these causal connections between our feelings and how we're going to act there's a reason why I don't drink a beer while I'm trying to grade my students work if I'm in a, an emotional or sort of psychological state of inebriation and the pains and pleasures that come with that then I will don't have it quite as much relish for doing that grading in a robust way um, and I'm like oh can I get done with this quickly or something like that so I avoid that I use that knowledge to try to direct my action um, I'm gonna actually switch back over here to the video now because um, I like to talk to you and see me and expressive so our we, we sort of track how there are these connections between our feelings and our actions when people say well I know myself like I know what's gonna happen here it's like that understanding of how those links happen, how those connections happen. Um, so that's that's what Aristotle is talking about there. Now, with that whole picture set up, where reason is able to like see those connections, but it can't influence the situation directly. Um, there's a question: Why do we have the feelings that we do? Where do those dispositions come from? What gives shape to them? And I think if I was asking you, Jennifer, who's here in the chat room with me, or any of you who are watching this later, if we were having a conversation, and I just posed it to you, like, why do you think people feel differently about things? Um, probably the answer would be experience. Right? We all have different backgrounds. We've lived in different circumstances, and we've made different actions. We've behaved in different ways. We've been prompted to behave in different ways. Aristotle thinks 
It's the actions that we take that determine our character. And this shouldn't probably sound like it's coming from left field. This is the idea of like healthy habits or unhealthy habits. That if we engage in certain actions, that's going to come back and affect us. Incidentally, um, all of you know I'm, I'm a Buddhist and I've got some Buddhism going in the background. You've probably heard of the, the Buddhist concept of karma before. But a lot of times karma gets misunderstood in the West, especially in America, as sort of like some supernatural or metaphysical like force that makes sure everyone gets theirs kind of thing. That sort of like justice evens out, like what goes around comes around kind of thing. But really what uh, traditional Buddhism means by karma is just the phenomenon whereby when I act, when I behave outwardly, I also am a thing affected by my action. It can sort of feel like I'm affecting things outside of me, like I'm like pushing things, you know, and, or my actions have effects on other people. But every time I act, Buddhism is like, you affect yourself. And how do you affect yourself? In your character. And this is basically the same story Aristotle's giving. Remember I said a while back that Aristotle believes every action is accompanied with its own unique flavors of pain and pleasure, both the things that draw us to that action and the things that keep us away from that action. Um, and he thinks when you do an action, it's like you're tasting those pains and pleasures. Um, the more that you taste them, the more that you expect them. And that's where those dispositions that anticipate those things start to form. Uh, and that'll become, those feelings will get stronger and stronger with more repeated exposure. It's not completely unlike, say, something like addiction. Like, do a bunch of cocaine. It acquaints you with an experience. If you do a bunch more cocaine all the time, pretty soon now you're going to be addicted to cocaine. Your motivation to do more cocaine increases by engaging in the action. Um, so there's a kind of feedback loop that Aristotle is sort of setting up theoretically here. Dispositions are the thing that cause me how to act, but it's the actions that shape and determine my dispositions and round and round and we go. And when we, people talk about the cycle of addiction, they're talking about this kind of phenomenon. But Aristotle's saying, that's not just addiction. That's happening across the board. So this sets up an interesting scenario. Remember, Aristotle says, we want to know what's good so we can do it. So if we know what the excellent end is, we know how we ought to be acting, or, or I'm sorry, we know... Um, we know what is the goal, the function that we'd want to be able to perform excellently, and then we figure out what actions need to be performed in order to accomplish to perform that function well. Like if, if the function is to hit a baseball really well, I need to know, okay, what, you know, what approach at the plate should I be taking? What kind of swing, the mechanics of, of how I move my body in order to be able to hit baseballs well? Um, then I need to figure out how to feel so that I feel the right way. Uh, baseball is a really good example, actually. Um, I, I tend to use it a lot with Aristotle because uh, when you're up at the plate, you're not thinking reflectively and rationally about every pitch that's coming down. It's really a feeling thing. And you train your feelings so that the pitches that are good to swing at, the ones that it would be the right idea to swing at, that would be the right action, are the ones that feel good to you. And those are the ones that prompt you to actually swing. And the ones that are bad, that are like way out of the strike zone or unhittable or something like that, the ones that are really tricky to hit, I train myself through repeated activity, like batting practice and stuff like that, to feel bad about those ones. Because though if I feel bad, I feel painful about them, and I avoid swinging at them. That's Aristotle's sort of vision here. But there's this feedback loop. So how do you get your character to be good? Um, and Aristotle really says, you can't pull yourself up from your bootstraps about this. And he takes a kind of paternalistic attitude about this. Aristotle thinks in order for any of us to have virtue, we need teachers. We need mentors. And not people who just feed our intellectual mind, but people who basically force us to do the actions that we wouldn't necessarily choose for ourselves so that we become acquainted with the taste of these pains and pleasures and reinforce those in our character more so that we end up doing it of our own accord later. This might sound like brainwashing, and in some ways that's totally accurate. I mean, it, it, it probably feels, brainwashing sounds extreme, but um, it might feel more familiar if you're just thinking about parenting. That like, uh, kids at a certain point, they don't have 
uh, the character traits of maybe uh, reflectiveness or self-discipline or self-awareness and responsiveness to circumstances to act in the right way. So what does a parent do? Puts them in situations where they do actions where they can train and start to learn those things for themselves and those become acquainted with those feelings and that shapes and molds their character so that when they become older they don't need that paternalizing anymore because they're already going to be doing it on their own. Um, so the kind of cultivating of good character is like child rearing, good parenting. That's how Aristotle would look at that. Um, the same way that he thinks we don't start with intellectual virtue, that that's something that has to be taught and trained, and we need to be taught by the world through experience. Same thing with virtue, too. Some outside force is needed to interrupt that cycle and put us on the right path. Um, so in, in some ways, Aristotle is like very modest about virtue. Again, it's not like you can take complete credit of this sort of stuff. Um, having those mentors, having those uh, parental figures or something like that uh, is part of maybe the necessary resources from the world in order to be able to live the excellent life. Without that, I wouldn't be in a place where I can act with understanding in a way that is excellent. Okay, now I think, if especially if that paternalism stuff kind of rubs you the wrong way, or you're kind of thinking, you know what, I think people can pull themselves up from their bootstraps. I think there's room for that. Um, so this is a little bit of sort of my, um, me adding, oh, you're getting static on the audio? Yes? Is it, is it still going, or it, can you let me know when it's not? Here, I'm going to pause the video for a second. Okay, so we're back. Um, so uh, I think that the paternalism thing can maybe be a little off-putting, especially if you think like, yeah, I feel like there, I feel like I got this influence in my life where I, you know, I've taken steps where I've been like, here's a problem in my character, and then I've done something, I've taken some course of action to kind of correct that, to to like work on myself and it, and self improvement, and that this is something that is uh, possible. So I think there's a way to make that phenomenon compatible with what Aristotle's throwing down too. I, I don't think um, he's completely rejecting that possibility, but his theory does set up the conditions for how that could be possible. So I'm, I'm adding a little bit to his theory here, but I think he'd be pretty cool with it. I think he'd be uh, welcoming of this little like adjustment, this little tweak that I'm putting. And I'm going to use a metaphor to talk about this. Um, so. And then maybe this will be like kind of where I'll leave Aristotle and then we'll start doing the big picture review stuff for all three. But so this will be kind of maybe the last, the last little bit for Aristotle. But uh, imagine you are like a car. So uh, the car moves uh, and that's like the actions you perform. And the direction the car is headed is sort of like the purposes that you have, that your action is going to lead to a certain type of result. And if we're talking about the the functions or ends of the excellent life that we're attempting to achieve, that'd be like we want to get to a particular destination. So if the car is driving in this direction, we're not going to get there. But if the car is driving in this direction, then we will get there. Um, so the driving is sort of like the actions you perform through your life. And the getting to the destination is like whether your actions fulfill that function excellently or fail to fulfill that function like the table that's holding things up properly or the table that's causing things to fall down as soon as they're put on top of it. Um, okay, uh, in the car, uh, there's a steering wheel that determines where the car is going to go, what action will be performed. And the thing that's behind the steering wheel, according to Aristotle, is dispositions, our feelings, our character. They're the ones in control of the wheel, okay? So depending on how we feel about things, I'm like, ooh, that looks good, let's do that. Or stay away from that thing, kind of thing. Um, those are the feelings of pain and pleasure. They've got control of the will, and that determines where the action is, what, what's going to happen. Um, okay. Uh, reason is in the car, but it's in the back seat. And it, it can't reach over the seat in front and grab a hold of the wheel or something like that. Like that's not what Aristotle has set up theoretically here. Reason is totally powerless in terms of directly influencing the direction the car is going to drive in. Reason is the backseat driver. 
And there's something else we can say for the metaphor. Reason, it's kind of like reason is holding the map. Reason sees where the ends are and where the roads are to get there and can tell whether the actions that are being performed where the car is currently headed is in the right direction or the wrong direction. But you kind of need to imagine uh, reason is kind of like uh, it's a hostage of this whole situation. Like it can see everything that's happening, but it can't do anything about it. So it's kind of like um, being a passenger on a runaway train where you can see the, the like obstacle on the train tracks that's coming up and it's not happened yet, but you can see it happening. But you can't do anything to stop the train wreck, and it just be it might have, it might invoke feelings of of like um, just like desperation. Sometimes it can feel like that living inside of your life um, that you're like I do all these things and I can see that it's wrong, but I keep making the same mistakes no matter what, and it's like I'm a runaway train, right? Um, I actually think this maps pretty well onto a lot of the experiences of addiction, where it's like I judge this as wrong. But my judgment of it being wrong, that I shouldn't be doing this, doesn't stop me from doing it. I still keep doing it. Um, I don't know how familiar any of you are with 12-step uh, program, Alcoholics Anonymous, stuff like that. But step one is recognizing you have a problem. That's just kind of accepting the judgment that this isn't good. But there's another 11 steps before, you know, recovery is happening, right? And, and addiction is being sort of like dealt with. Um, and that's a complicated, painful process. So. Uh, we like to imagine like we have a lot more control of ourselves than we actually do, and that's definitely what Aristotle's saying here. But what if, what in this car metaphor that I've got, is there a way, like if you're driving in a car with someone and you're the backseat driver, you've got the map, the driver doesn't have the map, maybe they don't know the territory, they don't even know where they're going, what streets are which, and you know, where is, which way is the destination. Um, there's a way for you in the backseat to influence the direction the car goes in. You can say what you see on the map. You can be like, "Hey, if we're trying to get to uh, if we're trying to get to Dick's Drive-In, we need to take a left here, right? Or the movie theater would be there's three blocks back that way. We need to turn around, pull a Yui. If the driver listens to you, then what you say will affect the direction of the car, right? But if the driver doesn't listen to you, then you can say anything that you want, and that's not going to affect the direction of the car. And that's kind of like what I think Aristotle would say about the relationship between reason and character. Imagine uh, that you could have feelings about rational arguments. Right? So if we have a character where we take pleasure in doing actions that are consistent with judgments from reason that rationally make sense, uh, then we will act on the things that reason sees and reports as happening. And if we find painful things like uh, arbitrary action or actions with double standards that are contradictory or that are done from reasons that are really rationalizations, that they don't really make sense, now there's a way for reason to have its foot in the door in influencing character that will then determine action. Okay, if we have sort of sentiments backing it up, kind of like Mill was talking about, where we find rational judgments persuasive because they have sentiments connected with them. Well, I think one thing that Aristotle would want to clarify about all this is that um, there's a bridge there. You've got to have feelings about rationality. And I coin this as reason responsive sentiments, that you'd have to have a character or a temperament where you care emotionally you have feelings of pain and pleasure about what's happening in the rational landscape of things um, so if I find it and I think a lot of us have feelings like this like we don't want to be seen as irrational I want to see that like hey I've got a plan here right that I'm making choices deliberately they're consistent with other choices that I make I'm not just talking out of my ass or acting on whim but I really do have considerations that I'm holding in balance with my actions and those are consistent and there's other feelings going on too about like why would I want to do this particular action versus that particular action but the idea of consistency itself being pleasurable and inconsistency being painful is what lubricates that whole process and makes it happen um, now that doesn't necessarily happen um, 
I, I've certainly encountered elements in myself and certainly in other people that I've met uh, that don't uh, that are not working on the the game plan of reason responsive sentiments um, I um, well hmm I'm thinking back to my childhood here pretty early on in my childhood I, I my my personal circumstances I had this thing going on I was like the oldest kid and and I had a brother and sister very close in age and I wanted to be like an adult from a very young age um, so I had kind of feelings about mimicking how adults do things, which involves rules and consistency and sort of reason responsive sentiments were happening there. But there was a time in which I didn't. Um, there, that was something that grew into existing. It didn't. I wasn't born with it or something like that. So what if I never had developed them? Well, then people could be. My parents could have given me great advice. I could have even my own imagination, my own reason could be like seeing the connections. But it wouldn't necessarily make a difference in my character unless there was some other sentiment, some other emotional disposition that was going to connect the dots on those things. So I think reason responsive sentiments are an interesting theoretical object because once we've got those, make maybe those need to be taught. Maybe those need to be paternalistically inculcated in us. But once we learn those dispositions to take pain and pleasure in a deep way about rational consistency and inconsistency, um, then we're in a position to be empowered to work on those other parts of our character that need to be fixed. Um, once I'm able to do that, and I've got wisdom, like I need experience and training to think properly too, but once I've got those pieces put together, now I might be in a position to be my own mentor, to like identify, to have self-awareness, to recognize the parts of my character that are vicious, that are vices, that are not virtues, and to take the deliberate courses of action that will train up those parts of my character, that will help to not continually reinforce bad habits and build positive habits. And people do this all the time. Um, I have a friend I, who loves jogging. I mean, he, he was an old bandmate of mine. We were in an electronic band together for like five, six years. Um, he, and he always liked to make music that he wanted to listen to while jogging. So all of our songs had this kind of like this like steady electronic beat to them that would be like good for a good pace for jogging. And he always tried to convince me about it. He's like, Tim, I know you don't like to jog. I didn't like to jog either. But if you just jog, you're like, maybe no, you need to do it for your own health, like a rational reason for it. Just start jogging. And when you do it on a regular basis, it will cease to be painful and start to be pleasurable. Like your character about it will change. And they'll eventually do it. Now, I've never uh, taken that advice. And so my character is still in a vicious way. I don't have that virtue. I don't have that character trait developed. But I believe him. I believe him. Uh, and maybe it's a problem. I've got other priorities right now. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I acknowledge that as a weakness of my character. And it's because I, uh, I just haven't taken that course of action. And if I did, I might feel differently about it. Um, but again, the feelings themselves are not verifying that it was the right choice to make. Because even vices will, even doing bad actions are going to end up developing feelings in you that will prompt you to feel like that's the right thing to do. So for Aristotle, the authority of what's the right way to feel, what's the wrong way to feel, what's the right way to act, what's the wrong way to act, ultimately does come to this external standard of just what is the function, right? What is the excellent function here? And are these actions and feelings the things that would accomplish that. Okay, so that's Aristotle. That's the big picture for him, is all this stuff about character building through actions. Uh, pain and pleasure showed up, like I promised last time. Uh, you know, he rejects the life of pleasure as the excellent life. But he does think that pleasure is, you know, if people think life is about pleasure, Aristotle's like, you're on to something here, because pain and pleasure is a pretty intimate part of the whole process. Okay, so... Um, let's, uh, let's jump back now to the big picture stuff and, and the kind of questions we had from the discussion posts. Um, and Jennifer, especially since you're here, uh, I'm, I'm happy to privilege your, your question since you showed up. Um, and you're wondering about, actually, let me pull up the, uh, I'll, I'll get your wording exactly. Um, uh, so you, you worded it here as, 
why did these guys sit around thinking about who should have moral authority, right? Yeah. Do you want me to un uh, you want to talk? No. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, feel free to jump in the text. I'll keep my um, speaker muted um, uh, so it doesn't show up in the video. But if you want to throw things in the text messages here, I'd love to. If there's discussion here, that's great. I, I, I um, lecturing is a part of the territory with being a philosophy teacher, and even in my on-campus class, I do a lot of lecturing like I do in these videos. But pontificating on issues is like not what I think it means to be a teacher. That's not all it is, and it's my least favorite thing about it. Um, maybe it looks like I love talking. I, I'm happy to do it, and I love engaging with philosophical ideas, and that's why I take pleasure in lecturing. But um, the more it's dialogue, I, the happier I am. That's the best part, and that's where I think a lot of learning happens. So let me try to address this, though. Um, I wasn't sure from your original post, Jennifer, whether it did have this tinge of like, who are these guys to say, you know, like what's good for me, or whether it had a little bit of that edge to it. Um, but it, or, or just kind of the general question of like, why are they concerned about authority in general? The answer to that question might actually be similar to how they would respond to this thing of who are you to say this stuff about what's true for me, morally, ethically, good, bad, right, wrong, all that kind of stuff. Um, the reason why they're concerned about uh, issues of moral authority of like, and I think all of them are, like Mill talks a lot about this with how he gives arguments to defend sentimentalism as the guide uh, for moral epistemology, like what's the evidence here for anything being better or worse or how we should act? And he's like, it's got to be sentiments because that's the only source I can think of that would be able to fit the bill as a genuine authority. Um, Kant is totally obsessed with it the whole way through his moral theory. Um, he's always concerned about uh, whether the moral judgments that he's making are actually justified as universal objective judgments. And Aristotle is too, with this whole thing of needing to define the function of something is how you ground, how you have some sort of touchstone for making judgments about what's the good way to act, the not the good way to act, what's the right way to feel about things. There's got to be something here that's holding it down. And I think the main motivation for all of them uh, in different ways, and maybe to different extents, but definitely it's a huge thing on the radar for all of them, and pretty much every moral philosopher who has ever offered a moral theory, is that we're really concerned about question begging. We're worried about circular reasoning. We're worried that the only reason that I make this judgment is because of something about me, rather than something about the stuff that we're judging. Um, none of these philosophers are claiming that they have some, like, like, as if they're like God who's able to, like, send down the Ten Commandments or something and be like, I'm the one and only person who has the right or the privilege to make judgments about what is good. None of them are doing that. In fact, their obsession about or their concern about uh, authority is precisely to resist that. They're concerned about that. Um, and the other thing that motivates it, and this kind of goes back to the discussion we had before, uh, many sessions ago about relativism is that um, there's a modesty in recognizing that you could be wrong and looking for an, uh, some sort of authority for grounding these judgments is for kind of trying to determine what would make me wrong like maybe what I think is right is not right even though I think it's right how could I be mistaken or how would I know if I was making a mistake what would make that so and what would be my guide for that like how can I critically self-evaluate? I need something else to lean on with that to kind of figure that stuff out. Um, and that's why they're all looking for these external authorities. So none of them are advancing their theory on their own authority. And they don't intend us to receive it that way too. That's, that's why I said early on here, it can, at the beginning of the quarter, I found when, in teaching philosophy classes that philosophers can kind of sound pretty arrogant because they're like making really big claims about really ambitious topics and they're just kind of speaking straightforwardly about it. Like, well, I think this is true for these reasons, and so that's right, and this, that, and the other thing. Um, but there, there definitely is a culture here of philosophy where everyone sort of recognizes with modesty that their say-so isn't the final word on the subject, even for themselves, and that um, this is a discussion, this is something we're working on, and that these philosophers are expecting and anticipating some critical reactions to their arguments. And they're trying to do their best to anticipate those concerns and create arguments that respond to them. But this is about exploring something that's bigger than them or us or any particular person. 
it's uh, like the metaphor I've used before um, early on about the kind of the moral landscape and that a moral theory is our attempt to like draw a picture that accurately captures that. Um, and we can be worried about whether our vantage point has uh, an act is an accurate vantage point about figuring that out. So that's why they get so concerned about issues of justification and why I'm concerned about it too. Um, like I said, heading into this crash course, um, I wanted uh, you to not just be familiar with these moral perspectives, because moral perspectives are a dime a dozen, but the, the attempts that each of these philosophers take for how they're trying to justify their view gives us more of an idea of how moral argumentation can actually look. And I think there's another question here on the, on the forum posts that uh, kind of gets into that issue. If someone asked about like what is reasoning, and I'm happy to answer that question. That's a very, very good uh, big picture question. Um, but the idea that there's there's something out there that might be beyond my frame of reference from my experience or what I've thought about that is a possible insight that informs this stuff that helps us get to better answers um, about the big questions of what is good and bad and how should I act, what's right and wrong. How, how is this landing with you, Jennifer, since, since you're here live with me? Um, is this answer addressing your question as you were asking it? That's one thing I wanted to, to kind of confirm. And also, um, what you think of these answers? Uh, do they satisfy? Uh, is there some concerns kind of left over here? Nope. <laughs> um, is a lot of the stuff I was saying kind of like, you're like, I, I don't know what just happened there. a lot to argue yeah yeah um, well personally I'll, I'll say this this issue of um, what counts as like an argument for moral matters how could we tell that one set of moral values is better than another or more justified or one picture or vision for human life is preferable uh, and we ought to adopt over the other options that we have. I, I'm very motivated by that question in my own philosophical work as an ethicist. I kind of think of it as the question and it's a very deep one and from working on it myself like being like I think this is important this, this question demands work it, re, it, it requires it there's a there is a need for the, this to be addressed for those concerns to be addressed um, and attempting to do it, I can tell you, it's not easy. And I'm, I put my efforts out there with modesty. This, I don't think this is something that, um, if you know about it or trained or take classes or get a philosophy degree or something like that, that it's like, oh, duh, this. Um, I think there's there's really deep, perplexing things that are related to an attempt to answer that question. But some of the things that make that are, I kind of think of as as baselines here uh, is that is a big one for me just so maybe I should tilt my hat here because this is kind of my own wrestling with this dilemma but um, the big ones for me are the modesty of recognizing I could be wrong I think the the height of arrogance is not to make a claim about what's objectively good for everybody universally like that's that could be pretty audacious but the biggest thing would just be to say that I'm always right about what's good for me like that's not modest in my view, not in my book, because it's basically saying I'm not accountable to anything. I'm always right about everything that I do for myself. And so I think modesty starts with recognizing my own judgments could be wrong, like the fallibility principle in the code of intellectual conduct. Um, so a commitment to that there is some objectivity here, theoretically, that's possible, uh, kind of like moral realism. I think comes from a basic motivation of just that it's right to acknowledge that I could be wrong about things, about, even about things that only pertain to myself. Like, what would be good for Tim Lineman? I don't think I know. And I, I think even by my own lights, I don't know. Because I look back on the judgments of Tim Lineman five years ago, and I'm like, yeah, I don't think he got it right. Now, from my position now, I don't think that was right. That's why I've got a different position now. And probably five years in the future, I'm going to think what I'm thinking right now is bogus. 
So there's something more going on here. There's a, there's a bigger landscape of uh, considerations. The other thing that I think is like a, a, a basic thing that kind of gets into this is that uh, it's sort of to say that, um, that there isn't something objective here, that there isn't some, something that grounds all of this that's independent of the authority of our individual judgments seems to be maybe, and I'm just kind of, again, just kind of throwing some stuff out here. One of the only ways to respect the gravity and content of any of the feelings and values that we actually have, right or wrong. So the things like, like um, say when injustice happens in this world and people are the victims of it and they've got feelings like, this was injustice. That it's not like it's just injustice because that's just your opinion, man. Or that's just how you feel about it. Like, if we think injustice has some kind of, like, actual weight to it, then um, there's got to be something that's grounding that other than just people happen to feel that way about it. Like, if, uh, if everyone was okay with slavery, I don't think that would make it okay. Like, even if the slaves were like, I'm cool with the slavery thing, and the slave owners are like, I'm cool with the slavery thing, everyone's cool with it, no harm, no foul, man. There's still reason to be like, I'm not okay, right? That that thought is open. That's an available option. And the only way that that could be an available option is if there was something objective here to get into. So maybe it provides a weight. Um, is, is this helping at all, Jennifer? Are these connecting, these things, points I'm making connecting? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, here's another one I could throw out there. Um, Oh shoot, I'm losing it. Come on, Tim. Your brain can do it. Oh man, this was the best. I was saving the best one for last, too. Oh, my stupid memory. Do that, that one. Um, Oh right, yes. Okay, 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 okay. All right. So this is um, this is a little bit more specifically to the kind of challenge or objection that says like, well, whose right is it for this person to make judgments about me? Kind of thing. Um, if we feel like there's something inappropriate about that, like like if we take this view that says. I'm the person who gets to make judgments about what's good for me, and that's not anyone else's business kind of thing. That position itself is making an objective judgment about morality. It's saying it would be objectively wrong for someone else to make judgments about what is right or wrong objectively for another person. And I, I think that's something that uh, oftentimes, when I hear that kind of objection, I don't know exactly where you're coming from, Jennifer, with it, but when I've heard that objection from other people before, they definitely, like, they, they kind of get worked up sometimes about, like, like, like some injustice is happening when a moral philosopher tells them, hey, this is an objective view of moral goodness. Um, and so to say, I reject the idea of objective moral goodness on the grounds of something that I'm treating as an objective moral principle, that's kind of self-defeating. There's a, there's a kind of um, self-undermining logic to that position. Um, so uh, the, um, and, and also in sort of, sometimes that, that comment the who 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 are you the who are you to have this right to do this sort of thing um, that rhetor that sometimes advances a rhetorical question and a, and it's a rhetorical question that can be answered uh, by these philosophers or or by me that it's like it's not up to us it's not our authority um, I I've said this at the beginning of the class and at the beginning of the quarter I don't want any of you students any of my students to take what I say as coming from any kind of authority from me, just because I have a philosophy degree or I'm employed as the instructor for this class or something like that. That's why I do all this hat turning sort of stuff. Um, sometimes I've got authority from like my education and background for being like Kant is saying this, not this. But when it comes to what's actually true, like whether Kant is saying something good or bullshit, that's hat turning time, right? And if, if you're convinced by the things that I say, I don't want that be to, because any authority that you're granting to me. I don't want that. 
I want it to be because the ideas get authority based on their own content, that the ideas justify their position um, rather than anyone else is kind of saying it. And I think Kant of the three of them, so actually now I can maybe speak more like a scholar here with some authority on like what is Kant doing. Kant is, the way that he talks about his own theoretical work is probably most explicitly this way, more so than Mill or more so than Aristotle, even though I think they're doing it too. But Kant is really specific to say, look, this isn't my idea. I didn't cook up the categorical imperative out of my own imagination and thought it was a great idea and thought everyone else should follow it too. He's saying, I'm just, I look at this issue, I look at the phenomenon of morality and I notice something. I notice that there's this, there's this common denominator that's like this through line that keeps showing up every time I take a look at a, a judgment of goodness, a normative judgment. I, whoa, look, there's that thing in there. Ooh, this one's got it too. And in fact, it sort of seems like that thing's needed for anyone to make any judgment of goodness. This is his argument for the categorical imperative, right? He's just saying, look, I'm just a person who, who spotted this and I'm, hey, take a look. Right, look at this thing too that I'm looking at. It's not you, it's not me, it's this thing out here that's sort of independent of all of us. Um, or Kant would say embedded inside of all of us because he thinks it's part of just being a thing that makes judgments at all, that, that that's a part of it. So Mill, Mill kind of says some things like this too, like, uh, I mean, he knows that utilitarianism is not something he invented and he's always saying like, look, hey, this utilitarianism idea has actually been around all the way back to Socrates, he says. Um, and it's there in the Bible, and it's there in this, that, and the other thing. So um, I think Mill recognizes that he can't own this theory as his own or something like that, or that we should uh, agree with it because he said it was a good idea, or he's convinced of it, or something like that. Arguments from authority are a big part of our lives. Um, it's the reason why we go to doctors uh, and car mechanics and specialists of all kinds. It's why I try to figure out the weather from... Uh, meteorologists instead of like my own guesses or something like that, right? Arguments from authority can be a rational form of reasoning. But when it comes to philosophy, we're like, mm, that's not good enough. Um, because we don't know what are the credentials for being an authoritative figure on exactly these sorts of matters. Like, and everyone's got disputes and disagreements about it. So we can't, it, it's not uncontroversial what it takes to be a moral authority. So we're going to leave that stuff open. We're not going to use any arguments from authority and philosophy. Instead, we're going to just look at the ideas on their own merits as much as we can. So um, I think those are all the big things that I would want to kind of say in, in response to that kind of concern. Um, and to get an idea here about why would it matter. Maybe I could make, I could make some connections here with uh, business ethics. I think the big concern um, about not having some kind of objective or universal grounding for morality is the same, because of the same problem that Mill brought up at the beginning of, of utilitarianism, our discussion of utilitarianism. He's like, how do I know if a law needs to change? If the rules of our society, the rules of our culture, the rules of our government, or any of the kinds of institutions that we have, or maybe the authorities that we've got, um, if there's something wrong going on there, how could we tell? There's got to be some like higher court of appeal here other than just what people actually end up doing. And that's even coming from Mill who's saying our feelings are the only guide to what's good. Right? He doesn't think that a government is self-justifying or just because they pass the law it's therefore the right thing to do. There's ways in which those things can go wrong and especially in the business world. There's a lot of practices. There's a lot of patterns of behavior. The whole economy has a structure to it um, and rules for conduct. Um, and those might be wrong, and we definitely have disagreements um, in our society about what should be going on there, what would be right or wrong, and that's what this class is going to focus on, if you remember uh, from my discussion of the curriculum at the beginning. It's not just going to be about, here's what the law says about you know, how to be an ethical accountant, or at least a, a, an accountant who's not doing illegal things. We're going to focus on those issues that are not settled the things that are controversial that people have rational disagreement about and try to make some progress on that. I, I don't think that we're going to resolve all this stuff and this class is not going to be about you learning about Tim Lineman's answers to all the perplexing moral problems in business. Like 
I'm um, the the point of the class is not for me to share my philosophical view. My, my I take my job to be framing the problems and helping to understand what motivates the arguments that make it so tricky, but also where we might have hope for resolving it. Like what direction, what things need to be dealt with to resolve that. So. Um, Jennifer, feel free to jump in if, if you have some responses to the stuff I'm saying or it raises other kinds of questions that you've got. Um, I totally understand having issues with authority figures. I was uh, a very, uh, I, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to equate you to me because I wouldn't want you to be identified with me. But for myself, I, uh, I was just a huge, arrogant person in my younger years. And I was like, authority figures, no. I got a better idea about everything. My mom said that was going to be on my tombstone. That that was a thing that she used to always say. Tim, your tombstone's going to read, "Here lies Tim Lineman. He had a better idea." Um, so I I sort of sympathize with that. I'm like I'm not going to just take anything rolling over. Um, I mentioned I'm religious. Uh, just ask my pastor. Uh, I give him a lot of grief about stuff all the time. Like he he gives a sermon and I'm like. So uh, I had some issues with what you were preaching about today. So I, I'm cool with that. And I think philosophy is too. Uh, and that's why all these uh, authors wouldn't want to be taken as authorities. There's ways that can be bad. I'm, I hope to God that my character has improved from my younger years and I'm not nearly as arrogant and um, yeah, unwilling to consider the wisdom and insight of others. Um, that's something I've worked very hard to change in my character. Uh, but the the part of the part of it that can be a virtue is the skepticism. <laughs> You're not the boss of me. Yeah. Hey, another point here. Um, if you have that kind of moral perspective, if you're like it would be wrong for other people to control your life and your decisions, then you probably are a Kantian. I mean, you're, you've probably got that kind of moral perspective, and you might look to Kant as being a helpful friend and giving you a pretty strong case for why we should treat that as such a fundamental value. I mean, this kind of idea of respecting people's autonomy and their ability to be self-determining and make choices for themselves and not paternalizing them, not controlling them, not coercing their behavior, to not treat them as a means instead of respecting their existence as an end in themselves, namely a thing that gives ends to themselves by making choices. I mean, that's Kant's whole program. And you will see that perspective reflected a lot in business ethics. A big concern about ethical issues in the marketplace are concerns about autonomy. Um, concerns about regulative government is a lot of times coming from uh, concerns about protecting autonomy for people and their freedom. But what freedom is, what it requires, that's something we'll definitely be digging into because there's some messy stuff when we start talking about social institutions like governments and businesses and the whole economy. Like I, I think I might have alluded to during the Kant unit, there's definitely a way to read Kant where you see him as justifying libertarian positions, and a lot of libertarians look to Kant as like, here's the moral theory that backs us up. But you can also read Kant as basically condemning capitalism as being unethical. So you mean the fact that it can go either way just maybe indicates that there's a lot of potential disagreement about that too. That's another issue we'll get into. Um, okay, I want to hit up some of these other ones too here uh, that people offered. Um, okay, um, how, uh, there was a question here, how much that these three, Kant, Mill, and Aristotle, how much have they affected the ideas of each other? Did one of them have a great impact on the other? Why in what sense? Uh, someone else I think asked, did these three philosophers exist at the same time and place or were they widely separated? Did the later ones have the advantage of knowing the ideas of the previous ones to look better? I think I'll answer those together because they're kind of related. Um, Aristotle is the oldest, and we're talking ancient Greece. So that's many, many hundreds of years ago. This is hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, um, so like the B.C. stuff. Um, so that's Aristotle is really old. Mill is showing up in the 19th century, and Kant's showing up in the 18th century. So there's a big gap of time between Aristotle and Kant and Mill. Although, um, Aristotle's philosophy really was dominant for a very long time in stretches of Western civilization, the history of Western civilization. Um, I mean, virtue ethics was like 
I'd say almost kind of the only game in town for for like a long time. Um, even with all the disputes between like Plato and Aristotle and their ethical visions of justice and stuff like that, they're still basically playing the same general game of virtue ethics, just in slightly different ways. Um, and Aristotle had a lot of influence even through the Christian era, uh, where you've got all these Christian philosophers in the scholastic period, Middle Ages. Um, they always write about Aristotle. When they, when they write about Aristotle, a lot of them just refer to him as the philosopher. They're kind of like, you know who I'm talking about. Like, yeah. Aristotle, right? So uh, he had a big influence for a long time. There are other, there, he's not like, um, it's not like he's the only thing, but he's definitely the big thing and definitely has a lot of influence for a long time. Um, Kant kind of, um, oh, okay, I need to say this first. When we started this whole unit, I was saying like, this isn't really about these particular philosophers. The reason why we're studying them is because these three theories kind of cover a lot of the options that are just theoretically possible for how you could approach thinking about moral and ethical matters. Are there some other options here? Yeah. But a lot of the other diverse moral perspectives, you could ask people their moral opinions about things that aren't philosophers or maybe even some that are, they're probably going to start lining up with one of these big three theories. Um, they're kind of like the basic models that then all of our particular moral judgments kind of fall under. Um, they're not exhaustive. I, I'm not trying to say that they're the, they're the only options, but they're definitely covering a lot of, of they, those three, we study them, boom, we've got a lot of the entire logical space of, of what, what's sort of possible here. Um, so, and Kant is kind of a weird one here because he is a really original thinker. And his theory is pretty original too, like the just the philosophical articulation of the categorical imperative and all this stuff is very idiosyncratic. That was one of the things I said when I was framing the Kant portion of all this. But at the same time, if he's right, he's not doing something new. He thinks this has been around the whole time. People have been basically thinking about morality in terms of the categorical imperative. They just might not have recognized it theoretically. So he's kind of just observing this thing that's going on. So can you see traces of Kant and or Kantian ethics in older philosophies like Aristotle? Yeah, yeah, you can. And I think in some ways Kant is influenced by Aristotle. So if you're wondering about an influence there, I kind of think so. That's a little bit of my kind of academic two cents on the point. Not everyone agrees about that. But I see a lot of really interesting crossovers. Um, Kant never really says, I'm influenced by Aristotle. But there's little touches in there that make me think, yeah, there's something going on there. Um, Mill definitely is aware of Kant. So by the time Mill's writing, he knows all about Kant. Um, and he actually talks about Kant directly in his writings and like why he thinks Kant's wrong and he's doing something different. Um, so there's definitely a, a kind of, as you go forward in history, they're aware of the ones that came before them. Um, there's, that's definitely true. And, but I think like Kant uh, even anticipates a lot of the things that Mill is going to say in his version of utilitarianism. Um, some of the comments in the grounding of the metaphysics of morals are all right there. Um, so their time period doesn't necessarily mean, it's not like someone needed to write down this book before I was going to have this thought. I mean, when philosophers are thinking about this stuff, they're kind of just thinking about, they're trying to track all the options. Uh, I mentioned before that even if they don't always succeed at this, Philosophers are always trying to get outside of their specific time and place in history. Like they're not, tr they're trying to think outside the box of just the messages that they receive from their culture. They're like, what are the other options here that we need to be thinking about theoretically? Um, so they're always pushing on that boundary. So tracing those influences isn't maybe always as uh, important as it might seem. Um, it, there, is, there is this kind of thing like uh, lit theory, where you like see the influences of one author, like who's influenced by another author, or like a poet who had this other poet as a kind of a role model or something like that. Those things happen in philosophy for sure, and people are influenced by each other's arguments. Um, but I, I think, I think the three theories that we've studied are pretty distinct from each other. They got a lot of big differences going on. Um, and if there's kind of overlap, it's because there's just kind of some general overlap things that happen when we're just thinking about ethics and morality um, that they come up against. Um, let me see if there's other things to those questions. Um, 
the, oh right, did the later have the advantage of knowing the ideas of the previous ones to look better? I mean, if you're if you're Mill and you're writing after Kant, um, then you definitely have an advantage, right? Of like Kant's been like, here's all my best work, and now I'm dead and I can't say anything more. Uh, so Mill can look at that and be like, okay, I want to deal with all this stuff. Like I said, I think Kant does anticipate some of the things that Mill is up to, and he has responses to them. And I don't necessarily think that Mill's got the better position just because he came later. In some ways, I think Mill misunderstands Kant's project uh, with some of his objections. So this is, this is my two cents on this, just Tim Lineman's opinion. But um, I think there's some ways in which Mill misses the boat with Kant. Um, and I think there's some things that Kant has to say that even though Mill came later and knows about them, maybe didn't adequately address, right? And this is part of the debate. Um, and that's why, thankfully, there are still philosophers, and we don't just worship our historical heroes or something like these great figures of history as authorities, because what you basically got are people trying to continually improve on these things. You've got modern Kantians, you've got modern utilitarians, and it's not kind of like looking back to the scripture of what they wrote before as like the final say on this stuff. We're like, they could be wrong. Yeah, maybe uh, Kant hadn't thought about this idea from Mill. Maybe he can give an answer to that. Or Aristotle's probably got some updating to do because it's been a lot of centuries. Is there, you know, what parts of the theory hold up? Which ones uh, we've got some more philosophical ideas that now maybe deal with that or criticize it or something like that? There are a lot of modern virtue ethicists. I've got we've got a couple Aristotle scholars on the on the in the department here at Bellevue College. I debate with all the time. <laughs> so there are people trying to work on that and improve it. Um, and that's always what I want to say about studying great philosophers of history is like, don't get worried too much about what they are or what they say as much as whether the ideas that they're bringing up have merit or don't have merit. Sometimes there's these scholastic disputes we get into philosophy about like, did Aristotle really say that? Does he really hold this position or does he hold this one? How do we interpret him? Eh, I don't know. And at the end, at, a lot of times for me it's like, does it matter? Does it matter what Aristotle thought? If we know, here are the two options of what he could have meant, let's just look at those ideas and see which one has the best argument supporting that we think it's true, rather than like which one Aristotle believed. That doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so there's that. Um, does some have a great impact on the others? Why in what sense? Yeah, I, I think uh, for Tanya, your question here, um, for me to answer that question in more depth than I already have would be a whole nother set of lectures. And it's the kind of thing that, um, like we're doing this as a crash course, I mean really tr tracing the, the lines of the parallels and the possible influences is like a big, big academic project. It, it takes a lot of work. Um, I guess, um, and I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a historical specialist on a lot of these things. Um, I mostly have just looked at them for their ideas and thought about the merits of the ideas rather than really tracing, oh, we have evidence to think that Kant was really moved by this passage of Aristotle or something like that. And that's kind of what it would take to answer that question in a really robust way. But like I was mentioning, I see a lot of parallels between Kant and Aristotle. What are they? So you're kind of wondering about some of the details. A big one is the moral psychology part. So Kant's distinction between uh, self-generated laws and laws of inclination seems to map to me pretty closely on Aristotle's distinction of the two sides of ourselves as the rational side and the character side. So I think that's a pretty big influence. But I, I mean, it's not like Aristotle can trademark those concepts. They're so basic and abstract that um, maybe not. But seeing them as, as really these two separate sides of us that play by very different rules, I mean, that's, that's a parallel that I see. Um, Kant also is taking a kind of functionalist approach to things. Um, Aristotle is thinking as a functionalist, right? Uh, the purpose of something, the function of a thing defines what's good for it. Um, Kant's got a lot of that going on too, but in a, a level of uh, cognitive science, like if, uh, I have this like big intro to Kant lecture that I usually give to my ethical theory class before doing him, and I didn't give that to you guys, um, but kind of how Kant thinks about the workings of the mind itself he thinks of in a very functional way. So when he looks at a judgment, like a moral judgment, he's like, what needs to be happening in the mind? What architecture needs to be happening in the mind to allow us to even be, for it to be possible for us to even form this judgment? 
Um, and that's going to be a basis of its justification. I think I might have said a little bit about that for his argument for the categorical imperative, that without um, endorsing the categorical imperative, it wouldn't be possible for me to say this cup of water is good or anything else is good, the cubs are great, you know, something like that. Um, so I think that is traceable back to Aristotle too. But definitely there's a big difference between Aristotle's functionalism and Kant's functionalism. But those differences get into their bigger picture philosophical theories, which I won't try to give a big lecture on right now. Okay, but if you want to talk about it more sometime, we're always down for that. Um, reasoning, yeah, let's talk about this. A uh, word you hear quite frequently from Mill and Kant and Aristotle. Aristotle makes a big deal about rationality in his vision of an ideal human. Uh, but what does it mean to really reason? That is one of the biggest questions that philosophy asks. Um, it's one of the big ones. And it's really big and it has great importance because your answer to that question is relevant for probably anything else we do in philosophy. Any other thinking that we do, it's going to be some kind of reason. So what does it mean to reason? Um, I teach critical reasoning class every quarter, pretty much. Um, so uh, I think about this a lot, too, myself. I think the safest way, so that I'm going to keep the hat turned, because this is just my kind of, this is a controversial field. I want to flag that. So those apologies, you know, viewer, viewer discretion advised, uh, you're warned. Um, but I think this one of the safest ways to approach this is by defining it in a way that doesn't beg the question too much on the, the issues that are controversial about rationality. But there's some things that are pretty uncontroversial about reasoning. One, it's conceptual. It involves concepts and principles. So that's, that it, reasoning involves that. It involves reflection in some sort of way. And then finally, the other kind of key feature that's pretty uncontroversial is that reasoning is some kind of system of accountability for our beliefs. If you're not holding yourself accountable for your beliefs as being possibly right or wrong or appropriate to form that judgment or inappropriate to form that judgment based on some sort of standard, then we're probably not talking about reasoning anymore. And that's part of why a lot of philosophers are opposed to moral relativism, because they're like, that basically is just gutted all reasoning there's no reasons to consider for ha having one set of moral values versus another or acting one way versus another if moral relativism is true. Um, by, by being a relativist, you've just undercut the ability of any kind of objective accountability for our judgments. And with accountability out the window, there goes reason. Like rationality is just gone. Now, a big thing that separates different philosophical views of rationality comes down to like what are those standards of accountability? What how do what are, what are they in content? They're, what's their substance? Um, but something I mean to to kind of scratch the surface of logic, and that's all I'm maybe able to do in a short space here. There's some there's a basic idea when you make an argument, you're providing rational support for a position. So you've got a conclusion that might be you think a fact obtains in the world. It like, could be like a scientific theory. Uh, or like a, this thing happened at this time. Like this person was the murderer, or if you're a detective or something, uh, investigating a case. Or it could be like a moral claim. This value is important. Or the supreme principle of morality is the principle of utility. Or I ought to do this action right now. Any of those kinds of judgments are claims. They're, they're, they are judgments. And if we're reasoning with them, we're thinking about why. Why to believe that? Why have that value? Why do that action? I want an accounting for this. And that accounting will be my reasons, my premises of my argument that are supposed to justify my conclusion. And the hope of anyone making an argument is that, well, if it's a good argument, there's something about how accepting the premises sort of requires me or leads me to accepting the conclusion. Um, that it, it's kind of like um, when we say informally, like in everyday discourse, something like the conclusion follows from the premises, right? Or that would make sense, even to make it even more informal and, and ordinary. Um, those are cases of reasoning because they're talking about some kind of accountability for a belief or a position or a value or an action. 
Um, I think that's probably the safest way to go about it. Um, when Kant and Mill and Aristotle are talking about reasoning, they're definitely falling under that kind of very general description. Um, they have some different ideas about it. Like Kant really likes the distinction between a priori reasoning and a posteriori reasoning. Uh, and the difference between them is reasoning using experience as a premise in some way or another, or reasoning that doesn't require experience to make the case for something. That would be a priori. If I'm using experience or observational evidence or something like that, that's a posteriori reasoning, and Kant thinks that's very different from a priori reasoning, but they're both still reasoning. Why? Because they're still about accountability to reasons, um, just maybe different sources of accountability there. Um, logic is pretty basic to this, uh, and logic is all built on the idea of not contradicting yourself. And I talked about that a little bit with the introduction to Kant about, like, if you're going to say, uh, if I if I ask you like do you think this is true and you say well it depends and then I say depends on what and you draw some line in the sand the the goal of of drawing that distinction there is to provide some kind of universal pattern or rule to your judgments that make them consistent so that you're not holding double standards you're not contradicting yourself something like that um, that's pretty basic to reasoning too logic is basic to rationality um, and what's basic to logic is the principle of non-contradiction. Um, that if you do contradict yourself, then I don't even know what you're saying. And actually, uh, when I teach my logic class, I, I kind of as an exercise, I'm like, if you give me a contradiction, I can prove to you anything I want. As to kind of motivate why the law of non-contradiction is so essential to thought, reasoning, logic, all this kind of stuff. So that's another thing I might um, bring out there. Um, one thing that gets a little more interesting about answering the question, what is reason? And I think this is true for a lot of these philosophers, but especially for Kant. He kind of emphasizes this a little bit more than the other ones do. Um, when we talk about reason, like capital R, reason, we're referring to really a faculty of the mind, which manifests itself in multiple ways. It does manifest itself when we, as the kind of thing that enables us to reflect, like when we're doing this, like, hmm, what do I think about that? Hmm, would that make sense? Here's an argument I could construct. This kind of reflective rationality, the faculty of reason in our mind allows us to do this. And something going on in our brains um, that gives us the functionality of being able to engage in those activities. But a lot of philosophers, especially Kant, think, Reason itself is also something that provides a structure to consciousness itself. So if I'm just even thinking in terms of concepts, reason is the thing that makes that happen. So conceptual identities, conceptual boundaries are also attributable to reason. So we're asking, what is reason? Reason might be just the, the thing that lets me be sentient, that lets me recognize experiences, identify them, think about them, uh, conceptualize them, maybe even experience them itself. That's constant. Um, so maybe that answers that question. Um, do people really apply these moral philosophies before making decisions? Or do they only do it in the aftermath when they're analyzing a situation? That's a really great question. Uh, that's the last one on our list, so after this I'll, I'll cut off the video. We're almost at two hours. That's good time. Good timing for getting everything done we wanted to in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I think this is a really good question, um, to, I, and I saved it for last because it's a nice transition into what we're about to do with our new phase of our curriculum. Because we're about to get applied, right? We've been in the theoretical realm. And there have definitely been moments where I've been trying to make some connections here about like this theory will connect to this issue or would cash out this. If you were a utilitarian, you'd make this choice kind of thing. Um, but now we're really thinking about that. We're thinking about specific situations and sorts of dilemmas or choices that you have to make um, that require that it's not just a thought experiment it's like in your face kind of thing we're anticipating that and in those moments um, the question is what would be the relevance of all this all this moral stuff like all this moral thinking all these moral theories how would they connect um, are they really useless to you in the moment but then you know we maybe talk about them do some hand wringing after the fact or something like that. 
Um, I want to answer it this way. The answer is both, I think. If you're asking, well, there, there's also another, there's actually two, two other questions here. One question should be like, do people do that? That's kind of how you worded it. Do people do this? Uh, and the other one would be, should people do this? And those are going to be different, of course, and uh, I'll have answers to both of them. Do I think people do it? Yeah. Do I think they should do it more? Yes. Do some people not do it? Yes. Right? Some people act without considering moral theories. They, they are not reflecting on their actions and the reasons behind those actions critically, or maybe thinking about their values. Um, but it would be absurd to say people never do this. Um, people do it all the time. Um, they, they know that they can maybe anticipate that there's a choice coming up, and they're like, I need to really think about this. What do I want to do? What direction do I want to take my life in? Or, man, this decision could impact a lot of people. What are we going to do with that? Um, and they do try to think about it in moving toward the theoretical direction. So one argument I sometimes use to defend the legitimacy of studying moral philosophy, especially moral theories, is that it's really it's not a different game than our ordinary moral life. It's sort of the logical conclusion of what we would do in our ordinary moral experience of morality in our lives if we just pursue it far enough, like if we commit to that thing far enough. Because it's what's going on in this like big picture abstract theoretical world that Kant, Mill, and Aristotle have been playing with is like imagining it starts with like here's a particular action that you're thinking about doing and someone asks you why do you think that's the right thing to do? And you're like, oh, because of this thing. And they're like, well, why about that? Well, because of this thing. Like a kid pestering their parents about something like, why is the world like this? I mean, this world seems weird to me. Why are we following this rule? And the parents are like, well, because of this, yeah. And they're like, well, why is that true? And it keeps going, keeps going. If you follow those why questions far enough, you get to the world that Kant, Mill, and Aristotle are playing with. And the ultimate question, which we were talking about earlier today, how do moral theories ever get justified? Where's the, what's the ultimate court of appeal or authority? for moral judgments, for moral truth. Um, that's the ultimate why question. So I think these things are just kind of the natural extension of it. So if you've got people who are thinking about the decisions they have to make and holding them with great moral gravity, then I think they're naturally led into thinking about them theoretically. Uh, another thing that I think naturally leads more into the theoretical level is when people have to make decisions that naturally affect multiple people's lives. Like think like business managers. Um, if they're approaching their responsibilities with a concern about morality, then they sort of recognize that not everyone's in the same boat. People are going to be affected in different ways. And I can't just be thinking about this decision by only thinking about this small set of people or small set of consequences, but I got to be thinking about all the other stuff too. Just as a matter of practical business management, you need to have contingency plans in place depending on how what ends up happening in the world, right? Like how the market changes, um, being able to be responsive to that. You can't just think about what's happening right now, actually, but you have to anticipate other possible scenarios too. And that's what moral theories are trying to do. They're trying to think about, well, okay, if we make moral judgments with this pattern in these cases that we do confront, what about the other ones? What if this was different? How would that change things? Where are the line drawn? What's the overall pattern here? You know, what are those rules that then universalize? Um, so that's just kind of a natural extension of that. Um, I, I do think some people consult these specific moral theories when they're making their decisions too. But there are a lot of situations in, in this world in which we're not able to spend a lot of time thinking about it or like break out my philosophy notes and be like, oh yeah, so what, what would a utilitarian do or, or something like that. A lot of times where like you're faced with the decision, you've got to make it quickly, um, and you can't write a doctoral thesis on moral philosophy before you make the decision. What to do there? Of all people here, Aristotle loves this scenario and says a lot of things about it. Because remember, he said acting with understanding and knowledge is important for an action to be excellent. To, to be living excellently requires that. But he's like, what about all these weird circumstances in which you don't have the luxury of pondering this thing and thinking it out very carefully? Aristotle says this, the excellent action in certain circumstances might specifically require a lack of reflection because if you reflected, you'd wait too long and then the thing is spoiled. It needs a knee-jerk reaction right now. So you can't consult reason before acting. 
But what you might want to do is if you know these things exist, you know those scenarios happen, you want to be prepared for them. So you want to intentionally, with reason, informed with reason, train your character so that when that thing happens, you'll respond in the right way. And you're setting it up ahead of time. It's, it's not just like uh, like in um, the, the way you asked the, the question in, in the um, posting here, what was it, the wording was, or do they uh, only do it in the aftermath, right? You could also do it in the anticipatory, right? So it's not just thinking about what happened in the past and analyzing it with the theory, but anticipating possible things in the future and analyzing them with the theory, and then trying to set up your character so that you react the right way spontaneously when that situation happens without reflection. I think Kant could be open to this too, as like an action done from reason. If, if I know that there are these exigencies in which I'm not going to have the luxury of consulting rational reflection, I can, through reason, intentionally set myself up to be a certain way. Um, a couple other fun examples to illustrate this point. Baseball again. Uh, like I was saying earlier, like when I'm up at the plate and I'm seeing the baseballs whiz by at 100 miles per hour, I don't have the time to think about Hmm, do I want to swing at that one? Yeah, yeah, I think I will swing at that one, and then I swing. It's too late, right? But what you can do is try to train yourself to be sensitive to those differences to be able to know which one's the best one to swing at. So there's that, that uh, scenario. And here's another one. I've been thinking about this because of the talk I'm going to be giving next month. And I don't know if I'm going to work this tangent into my talk or not, but it's something I've been thinking about in, in Ethical Matters. There's a really famous principle that gets thrown around a lot by ethicists that says, ought implies can. And what it means is that um, if you have a moral obligation to do, some, to do something, you can only have a moral obligation to do things that are within your power to do, that it's possible for you to do. In other words, you can't be morally expected to do the impossible. Okay. Now, sometimes this set up some interesting paradoxes. What if, um, uh, okay, so... Uh, I'll, I'll embellish here a little bit with, I, I can't remember the example of the paper I was just reading was saying, but I'll, I can make up my own version of it. Let's say I made a promise to you to do something for you. Um, so now I'm honor bound. I have an obligation to fulfill my promise. There's ethical stakes involved now. Um, but I know about the ought implies can principle. And I'm a sneaky bastard who will, you know, bend the rules and find loopholes wherever I can. So instead of like, just deliberately failing to fulfill my promise to you. Uh, let's say the promise is to um, uh, pick you up at the airport. Let's say my promise is to pick you up from the airport. Uh, but I know ought implies can. So if I have an obligation to fulfill my promise, that's only possible. I, I only have the obligation if it's possible for me to do so. So I don't really want to take you to the. I don't want to pick you up at the airport, but I don't want to uh, uh, violate my moral obligation. So in a kind of loophole -ish sort of rationalizing mood, I decide to take some course of action which puts me in a position where it is impossible for me to, um, to uh, um, pick you up from the airport. For instance, let's say I get blackout drunk. And then you call me. And I'm like, uh, and you're like, hey, I'm at the airport. Why aren't you picking me up? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm totally wasted now, so I can't come pick you up. Sorry. And you can't blame me for violating my promise because I can't do it. I can't fulfill my promise right now. You wouldn't buy this excuse for a second, right? You'd be like, that is some bullshit, right? That doesn't justify it. Why? Because you put yourself intentionally in the position in which you couldn't do the action, right? So... That kind of rational reflection prior to the action of like setting myself up to do the thing is also something that you could be accountable for, I think. So this sort of thinking through the moral theory is not always in the moment of action or after the fact, but it could also be like setting myself up, right? Putting myself in a position so that I can do the right thing. Um, even if in that moment I don't have the luxury of rational reflection or theoretical reflection on what to do. Um, but when it comes to the aftermath stuff, um, there's, there's ways for that to be appropriate too, uh, and the theories can be really helpful for that. Um, a lot of times we might forget about the big picture ethical theories, and we follow our intuitions and act certain ways, and it's not like we're being completely unreflective morally, but maybe we're not being really rigorous and careful about it. 
And it might be good to check up on our choices and say, you know what? what could that have been improved on? I mean, maybe I was in the ballpark, but this could have been better. Especially with, like, say, utilitarianism, like maximizing utility. Was there some other factor that I should have, like, maybe I didn't know about then, or maybe I could have thought about, or something, some, something else I could have tracked that would have given that action a better chance of maximizing utility. That can be useful to, like, learn from our moral mistakes, or to just hold, to, like, it's not like, ah, it's in the past, too late now, can't do anything about it. It might still be useful to think back on it uh, and compare it against the moral theory to see, like, what are the things maybe I need to be tuning up or recalibrating about how I approach actions um, and choices and things like that. And that's different from like what Kant was denying about how we can't retroactively make uh, moral evaluations of like whether our actions had moral worth or not. Like, do I deserve blame or praise? Maybe that's impossible to have access to. But this kind of thing of like, it's kind of this way of reflecting on the past action is less like blame and praise kind of stuff, and more about just like like imaginatively putting myself back in those shoes of that moment of the decision as if the decision hadn't been made yet and being like, what? how should I approach making this decision? And that can be fruitful. I think we can learn from moral mistakes there. So um, I hope my answers to your questions were helpful here and maybe helped. A lot of the questions were not specifically about Kant Mill and Aristotle and the details of their theories, but kind of some big picture stuff about moral theories in general um, and their application and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I think that's good, too. I mean, I, I hope that helps uh, with building up this foundation for, for the rest of the class and what's going to be going on with it. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Maybe you get the sense at this point that this is a big world. And this little crash course is just like the tip of the iceberg on this stuff. And there's a lot more to talk about. And if you're interested in that, I'm always interested in talking with you more. I've had almost no, like I've been saying in past videos, still not a lot of phone calls, not, not a lot of, of uh, correspondence and rapport so far with students in the online class, and I would definitely like that. I would, I would think it, uh, mostly just because I think it makes this class a better experience for you. But So if you want to dig into this stuff more and discuss it more, I definitely would like to do that. And I've got some bandwidth for doing that too. It, it's not like I'm too busy to be able to do that. Um, I, and I will always carve out time for my students. Um, I, I value you and I respect you and I want you to get the best experience out of this as possible. Um, so uh, we're going to leave things behind, but you, it's very possible you have a lot of unanswered questions. If some of these theories felt like they're going over your head, um, I'd want to work with you about that. And, and it, you, we can, you can get there, um, of getting a really strong grasp of at least the basics and the essentials of what's going on with these perspectives. And I think that'll be really helpful for the rest of the class. Can you wing it in philosophy? Not if you're going to do it well, <laughs> but I always have students who are like, yeah, I can kind of just read some stuff here and there and bullshit my way through the class. And yeah, you kind of can. I, I'm not going to be posting exams that hold you accountable for your reading comprehension or something like that. Um, I've thought about it, but I don't want to run things that way. I want to have it done a little less mechanically and maybe inviting more sincere motivational participation uh, of just actually caring about this stuff. Um, and wanting to treat it right. And, and so that will require trying to like lock things down and check our understanding and see whether there's misconceptions or misunderstandings and stuff like that. And I'm really happy to be a part of that process with you. Um, the whole dumb questions thing was like, there really aren't, like the things that people are embarrassed to ask, I think are really, really helpful. And I love talking about the basics. I mean, ground level philosophy I think of as just as exciting and dynamic as high level, high you know, complexity theoretical philosophical activities. So I'm always down for it. I take pleasure in enjoying it. Um, so I don't want you to, I don't, you don't have to feel self-conscious on my account about it. I'd love to talk about this stuff more. Um, and there's my child at the door. <laughs> They're busted in on the classroom I'm in. Um, I need to wrap this up. But um, uh, so that's an invitation for the future. We are going to be switching gears. I'll be posting an announcement, the kind of weekend update thing, kind of alerting everyone to this, and putting some new assignments on the on the schedule, um, some new due dates. Um, the reading comment assignment is going to be done as a discussion post, as I've talked about before. Uh, check out the syllabus for the instructions again there. If you've got any questions, contact me. Um, 
and we're, we're going to be switching gears. It's going to be a little different. If there's any, I want to keep that transition as smooth as possible. Uh, it might be worth going back to my initial, um, thank you, Jennifer, uh, my initial uh, videos kind of going through the syllabus and talking through what everything is going to look like. That might be a reminder, um, but the syllabus itself should give you some guide about how things are going to be different here. Uh, and any questions, come and contact me. I'm happy to talk to you. And the code word for today. Oh, what's been going on? Code words, I'm sorry. Because I am sorry about mixing, uh, having to delay things from last night. I want to keep things as regular as possible. But So that's my code word. It's an apology to you. I'm sorry. Um, hopefully that won't happen again. And, and I can do some things to make sure I'm not getting totally run into the ground by the time I, I'm at these evening times. Because I think that I, my suspicion is still that's the best time for all of you. And I want to make that happen, make that accessible to you as much as possible. OK, so there we go. Thanks for the reminder, Jennifer. I appreciate it. I always get going and lose track of the most important thing, your grades. All right. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. And I'll be seeing you soon next week, Monday.